an original from Story Studio Network. I want you to think about this. Canadian forestry has a role to play in saving the planet. Absolutely, the answer is yes. Welcome to this Story Studio Network podcast series. I'm Dave Trafford. In this series, Aaron Trafford and I will explore a number of ideas that hinge on the notion of Canadian forestry helping to save the world. There's no path to a net zero carbon economy without the forest sector and forest products, full stop. We'll talk about how and why Canadian forests have the ability to shift the climate crisis and the economy to build a better future. There is no machine and no process known to man better than a tree that's sequestering carbon. We'll explore innovations in forest management that drive a green economy and directly address the climate issue. We have a significant amount of the world's forest land. With that privilege comes the responsibility of taking care of it. So welcome in to this special series produced for Forestry for the Future. It's the number one natural cause of disturbance in our forests. Newfoundland battles its largest blaze in 60 years as wildfires rage from coast to coast. In the lower mainland, take a look at this jaw-dropping images from a drone taken above Prince George, the city now on the front lines. The drone near Los Angeles is one of more than 48,000 wildfires started. The heat, record high temperatures are fueling wildfires in western Canada. That makes 2022 the most active wildfire season in more than 10 years. And the latest numbers from the Government of Canada suggest wildland fire prevention costs us more than $1 billion a year. In the U.S., wildfires accounted for more than $11.2 billion in damages. Between 2021 and 2022. And those damages and effects of wildfires are all the more dangerous and concerning because they're happening in urban and suburban areas of California, Nevada, and Arizona. Verisk is an insurance rating bureau in the United States, and their analysis suggests four and a half million U.S. homes are at high or extreme risk from wildfires, with over two million of those homes in California alone. Nine of the 10 worst and costliest wildfires in U.S. history have happened since 2007. The Insurance Information Institute says all 10 of those fires occurred in California, each causing several billions of dollars in insured losses. Now, there's no telling what the uninsured costs might have been. So with those kinds of statistics and the harrowing images we see of homes and communities being destroyed, it's, it's easy to understand the devastation fires can cause. Here in Canada alone, we have roughly 7,300 forest fires every year, and that's the average over the past 25 years. Those forest fires burn 2.5 million hectares on average per year. That number peaked at more than 4.5 million hectares in 2014 and just over 4.3 million in 2021. Whether fires occur naturally, usually because of something like a lightning strike, or they're caused by humans, wildfires and forest fires are occurring more frequently and more intensely because of climate change. So where does fire prevention fit into a thorough forest management plan. We obviously want to eliminate the threat to lives and the environment. At the same time, we know the effects of fires can promote healthier, more resilient forests. Okay, so before we dig into that conundrum, I just want to go back to a couple of things we've talked about in previous episodes of this podcast. We learned that kids' books and movies had a profound effect on our general understanding and the appreciation of forests. Yeah, we talked to Lacey Rose. And I'm the county forester for the county of Renfrew in Ontario. 
She's a professional forester in Ontario and admits her view of forestry was skewed by a movie. Every generation has a movie that they saw that gave them a negative impression of forestry. Mine was Fern Gully. <laughs> I'm back. Texas. Maybe you read the Lorax. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. And once there was a tree. Let's not forget the giving tree. And she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come and he would gather her leaves. It twists a bittersweet narrative around this whole notion that once a tree is cut down, once it's gone, it's gone for good. And we know that's just not true. Yeah, all good. So why are we even talking about this right now? Well, because the role and the importance of fire in forest management has nearly been set in stone by another cultural phenomenon. This time, a cartoon character created in the 1940s. He became a household name in Canada and the United States. Literally, the poster boy for forest fire prevention. He was a roaring success without doubt. And, uh, you know, I can imagine his story being studied uh, in an episode of Terry O'Reilly's excellent podcast series. You listen to Under the Influence? It's a great show. It's all about marketing and advertising and branding. It may have been one of the most successful influencer campaigns ever, but the public may have heard the wrong message. I, I think you should stick more with podcasting, less with trying to impersonate Terry O'Reilly. Okay, okay. <laughs> right. I just had him in my head, right? And I consider it more of an homage, really, than, than impersonation. Love the show. But the point here is, this campaign made textbook use of the fear factor. A three-minute-long PSA hit the television airwaves in 1964. It was vivid, it was dangerous, and it was dramatic. The forest is on fire. And the dramatic music score highlights the frantic and panicked effort of all the woodland animals to escape with their lives. The long distance view shows a raging inferno lighting the night sky as it roars across the hillside. And then he steps into the frame. Please, only you can prevent forest fires. Ah, uh, yes. Smokey the Bear. Yes, the Smokey Bear campaign was a huge success, instilling a broad, if not deep, fear of forest fires. The general public was highly aware of the danger and the damage associated with forest fires. And that was only driven home when Smokey became the subject of Paul Harvey's storytelling. Only you, they would say can prevent such tragedies as forest fires. And that message, adopted by the National Forest Service, became real through the example of the homeless little creature found whimpering in a smoldering woodland, clinging to the branch of a charred tree, an orphaned bear cub, whom the world came to know and to heed as Smokey Bear. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, for the rest of the rest of the story, he became Smokey the Bear thanks to Eddie Arnold. If you've ever seen the forest when a fire is running wild. Now, Arnold was a top Billboard cowboy country singer in the 50s and the 60s. And you know why Smokey tells you when he's seen He added the to Smokey's name just for the sake of the song's cadence, and it stuck. And this song was all part of a PSA campaign, the longest running campaign in Ad Council history. So what's the problem here? It it, it sounds like Smokey was not only on the right track, but he clear he clearly struck a nerve with his prevent forest fire message. True, he did. He's still a cultural icon nearly 80 years later. The problem is, there is a but here. Some scientists blame Smokey Bear for being too successful. Explain, please. All right, I want to introduce you to Steve Kazuki, 
Hi, I'm Steve Kazuki. I'm with the Forest Enhancement Society of BC as the executive director. Steve is among those who will tell you we have overcompensated when it comes to our understanding of forest fires and how we manage them. And a big part of that has been fire suppression. You know, the whole Smokey the Bear attitude that fire is bad and our policy that we're going to put the fire out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And we were very successful at doing that, but we didn't understand the ecological consequences, which are pretty dire. Thanks to the success of Smokey's campaign, we developed this reflexive cultural response to forest fires. Fire is bad. So fire suppression strategies, fire fights, and preventing fires are all good. But the unintended consequence may be that some forests are overgrown and more flammable. So really, Smokey's message should evolve and let folks know there is such a thing as a good fire. Yeah, yeah. Just as the science of forest management has evolved, a 21st century forest management plan would include things like prescribed burns, in some cases to remove that excess fuel in the forest. I'm Amy Cardinal Christensen. I'm Métis from Treaty 8 Territory, um, and I'm an Indigenous fire specialist with Parks Canada. In fact, Amy Cardinal Christensen says there is a place for traditional Indigenous fire practices in modern forest management plans. Well, I think for the thing that I do, so working with Indigenous fire practices, I think that they would work really well um, hand in hand with the forest industry um, because a lot of it is about preserving forests and the biodiversity in forests. And um, right now, many of our forests are, are managed for, you know, a certain species that's harvestable. And But I think for Indigenous communities, using fire is about biodiversity, um, but producing healthy forests. And the thing with that is that you make forests that are less prone to a disturbance like insects or fire. Um, so yeah, I think that that's where Indigenous practices um, can fit in really well. Paul LeBlanc is a forester in Manitoba, and he'd agree with Amy. I'm the district forester here in Swan River, Manitoba, and I work for Louisiana Pacific Canada Limited. If someone were to say to you, uh, you know, sort of absolutely, forest fires by no other, any other consideration is, is a natural disaster, what do, you, what do you say to that? Well, that's uh, not true, especially in the boreal forest in uh, Canada. The um, fire, of course, is what renews and regenerates the forest. Just talk to me about the sort of the... the the effects of the fire, I mean, in the aftermath of that fire, does that create um, a soil mix or whatever it might be that helps to regenerate that forest more quickly? Yes. So in the case of aspen, aspen will not sucker unless the adult tree is dead and then it has different hormones which trigger the suckering response. But it also needs the soil to warm up. Under a mature forest with a canopy, the leaves block the sun and the soil is cooler. The fire burns it, the sunlight hits the ground, and the ground is kind of charred and black. It heats up and causes a tremendous suckering response. And so we get 50,000 aspen per hectare regenerating after a fire. And uh, by the way, that young aspen is very important for ungulates like moose and deer and elk. And uh, the absence of it means they're uh, tight for food. So uh, having I'm, some young forest across the forest somewhere at all times is actually quite critical. So when you talk about suckering, you're talking about trees that are effectively growing out of the original plant? Yes. So the in aspen, the adult root system, aspen roots grow 10, 15 meters long, and it'll produce, each root will produce 15 to 30 aspen suckers from that adult root system. Their growth rate is tremendous because they're a young plant, but they have the adult roots. It's beginning to sound as if we can't have healthy forests without fires. So yeah, in some form or fashion, yes. I mean, you heard Paul there explain how a fire can be a natural part of an aspen forest life cycle and the forest life that relies on the aspen stand. And then there are other species of forest that can benefit from the innovative harvesting practices that emulate fire. 
but I'm still struggling a bit with the idea that burning a forest stand with all the smoke that comes from that fire is somehow good for the environment. Like that's a lot of carbon being released into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, and there's new research that compares the effects of wildfire to controlled burns. Uh, all the research coming out about um, like cultural burning practices and the smoke emitted from that compared to these out of control wildfire events show that cultural burning emits less carbon into the atmosphere um, and less wildfire smoke. And so recently, the American Lung Association just released a study on the importance of using fire in controlled ways in the forest, like that there is no no smoke option, like our forests will emit carbon, but it's just how we do it. Um, we can control when and where that happens and the amount of carbon. And one of Amy's colleagues at Parks Canada is Landon Shepard. I'm the fire and vegetation specialist in Jasper National Park, working for Parks Canada. He'll tell you we need to understand the role fires play in the renewal of a healthy, sustainable forest. Of course, forest fires are dangerous and they are destructive, but they've always been a part of the natural forest life cycle. I would think of it as as most purely uh, an element of, of change. Um, and uh, you can you can add to that and, and give it a, a positive spin and say it's a it's a force for renewal and um, and resetting certain ecosystems and, and restoring certain ecosystems. Um, but that again is is applying uh, kind of a uh, uh, an objective or or what are the implications of of that um, of that process. You know, at its very essence, it's it's simply a uh, process of of change, and uh, as such, you know, when we when we start to think of good fire or bad fire, that's that's us interpreting what we think it's either likely to do or what it has done. So, to this point, we've learned a forest fire helps rejuvenate, regenerate a forest. We've we've also learned. In some cases, controlled burns are an effective, more environmentally friendly way to prevent the forest fires. And we've learned from Amy that there's a place for cultural fire practices in a modern forest management system. But that still doesn't mean controlled burns can happen all the time, right? It needs to be balanced with harvesting. Many of our elders, when you go and talk to them now from different nations, they'll say that we can't just go and burn in the forest like we used to because colonization has just made such huge changes to our forests, including the forest industry and, and some of the, the management practices that have been done. So what first needs to happen is, you know, substantial thinning or other types of, of changes, um, you know, removing some of that fuel um, through thinning treatments. Uh, but I think one of the main issues that come is that much of that that needs to be removed through thinning is in merchantable timber. And so that's where um, for a lot of companies, then it's a, a, you know, a financial risk to go and do that type of work. But it's really what we need to see happen before we can reintroduce cultural fire practices. And that raises an important question. What do we do with the wood that isn't good for much other than burning? What we do, um, and many Indigenous companies throughout British Columbia are very much involved in going in after the, the commercial harvesting and taking away that biomass and using that, what used to go up in smoke, using it to create green energy. Now that we, we make electricity directly from that biomass from the forest uh, and, and use it here in BC and export it to Alberta, California, wherever through the power lines. We also make pellets, which are exported around the world. And so when we export energy from the forest to other jurisdictions, there can be another powerful greenhouse gas benefit in, in taking action against climate change because that green energy from Canadian forests can often displace energy that otherwise would have been produced uh, by fossil fuels in other parts of the world. Some of it can be used to create energy that's less harmful than fossil fuels. Yeah, and we're going to get into that. We're going to spend some time talking about the innovations in the development of wood products and bioenergies in, in upcoming episodes. But I want to come back to this idea that forest management needs to take fires into account. Paul LeBlanc says he and his team are emulating fire 
when they consider their long-term plans in Manitoba. In fact, uh, we did a 20-year forest management plan uh, that we submitted in uh, late 2019, where we're transforming how we manage the forest from a two- and three-pass harvest system to emulating fire, uh, natural range of variability. And so what that means is fires create variability, and that's been good for all the animals and wildlife in the past. So therefore, we think that's our best step forward. So we have a variety of what we call serial stages or ages, young, immature, mature, and old. And we want some of that across the landscape at all times. We want some young, we want some immature, some mature, and we purposefully retain old for that, to emulate fire and uh, have better forest management. So if I'm understanding you correct, we are emulating fire. So you're, you're having the effect of a fire without the fire. Yes. So we don't burn the forest first and then do some harvesting. Right. We harvest in a fashion like fire does. Now, what I've been talking about uh, with, the, with the disturbance sizes, that's at the landscape level. Scale is incredibly important in resource management. So at the stand or harvest block or disturbance level, we don't clear cut. We do what's called variable retention harvesting. And that's similar to a fire. Fires have skips. They skip over areas and they leave live trees within the fire. And that's incredibly valuable to wildlife and uh, insects and birds and a whole gamut of uh, wildlife and different uh, different species in the forest. Is the... Um Fire emulation, sort of a your soul or your primary uh, approach to then to the, the forest management. Yes, we use that. We used fire emulation or uh, natural range of variation as sort of the big picture overall primary cut of how we manage the forest. Our secondary was improving moose habitat, and emulating fire allows us to improve moose habitat. A little better but the really big deal with we manage uh, habitat the government manages moose populations moose you can have fantastic moose habitat but if the roads are all left wide open and there's lots of them people road hunt and they shoot all the moose with a natural disturbance block we can have a 500 hectare cut block one road in dead end it's easily patrolled we harvest we get out, we don't come back for 80 years. And so we have a lot less road that's open and a lot less road hunting of moose. When we started this discussion talking about the destruction and devastation wildfires and forest fires can cause, the billions of dollars that are spent every year on wildland fire prevention, we highlighted Smokey the Bear's success as the fire prevention influencer. But the science tells us forest fires play an important role in saving forests and the climate. Well, the cool part is forest management plans use harvesting strategies to emulate the effects and the benefits of a fire without the fire, without the carbon release. Incorporating fire and the effects of fire actually reduces the likelihood of more catastrophic wildfire, the kind that make headlines, emit so much emissions, and consume an entire forest. So just to punctuate the importance, though, of fires in the forest, Landon Shepard says forests that do not experience fires are actually more vulnerable. So vulnerable to um, uh, climate change impacts like uh, mountain pine beetle uh, is a great example for our uh, Western Canada and Western North America, really. In a period of five years, about 50% of Jasper's forests were affected by mountain pine beetle. That's not to say 50% of the forests were, were killed or, or damaged, it's just they were changed. And that's an awful lot of change on a pretty large uh, land base. And Paul LeBlanc takes it one step further. Stands that escape, forests that escape burning for 50 years, 100 years, and are significantly older. Uh, we have examples in our area where 
the forest has converted from a forest to non-forest, and it's simply a shrub complex. Mm. Then all the value of that and ecosystem services of that forest are compromised, and it's a far less resilient ecosystem. And the solution for those are disturbance, either a fire or we've done some ecological restoration where we've harvested areas that won't burn and got excellent regeneration and are, and are bringing it back from non-forested back to a forest. What, what, what when you say that they won't burn, what, how does, how do you qualify that? Oh, uh, well, there was an Aspen hazel area, uh, west of here that, was falling down and it about 80% of the trees are on the ground and the hazel shrubs underneath have filled in those gaps and we've gone from an aspen hazel ecosystem to a hazel ecosystem. Mm. So the government tried burning those sites on a dry spring and they could get a light ground fire going but there was insufficient fuel to get a crown fire the trees were too far apart. They really wanted to restore those ecosystems with fire, but were unable to because it had gone too far, too long without disturbance. So we went in and did some, we did a plan for them at their request. They approved the plan. We did some harvesting and we're getting excellent regeneration back. So some forests that do not experience fire just disappear. So at the end of this all, maybe Smokey's message was well-intended, but a little misguided. Now, to be fair, Smokey's message was targeting our behavior. Because the message called on all of us to be careful when we use fire. Good message. The problem is when you say, Only you can prevent forest fires. It makes it sound as if the fire is bad, rather than our negligent behavior. Yes, Some fires are good and can help our forests cope with the climate crisis. In our next episode, we're going to actually sit down at the kitchen table with moms and dads, many of whom probably grew up with Smokey the Bear. We're going to ask them whether they think our forests can actually save the world. For our producer, Becky Coles, for Aaron and the rest of the SSN team, I'm Dave Trafford. Thanks for listening. This podcast series is produced for Forestry for the Future. And for more information, I'd encourage you to visit the website forestryforthefuture.ca. And you may want to get involved in supporting a sector that's committed to growing a greener economy and driving our country towards a net zero carbon future for you and your kids. I'm Dave Trafford, and Canadian Forestry Can Save the World is produced by Story Studio Network. This is SSN.